Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Welcome back, you wonderful beautiful homeschoolers out there to our second part two of different homeschooling methods. We hope you had a good time last week listening to those. Those were a lot of uh, methods that we've heard about. Maybe you have heard about in the past. Um, We hope they were helpful to you. We're going to talk about a bunch of new ones today. These might be a little bit less known, um, a little bit more um, abstract in some respects and a little bit different way of handling yeah. things. So there's some new things for us, new things for us that we learned about as well. And so Errol, we're, we're back, but have we ever really, did we even leave? Who knows? <laughs> the magic of the internet. <laughs> so, silly. Um, so we hope you guys are uh, enjoying it. We're again, going to have all the links down below. So if you, if something touches on you, strikes a chord, ma- um, makes it a little bit of interest to you, you can go down below and click on that and do a little bit extra learning, you know, you know, a little homework, a little bit of mm-hmm. homeschool uh, parent-led learning uh, for you down there in the show notes. So make sure you click through those. Ariel, let's get to it. Yeah, let's start. So the first one is literature-based. Let's talk about it. This is literally just teaching through books, right? Books are essentially the main core of what you are you're learning. Like, right. Well, and this is, you're really using high quality literature and that's the foundation to learn your various books. subjects right. rather than, you know, relying solely on textbooks or structured curriculum. So you really are going to be integrating literature into every part of education. So Build Your Library is obviously a great example, great example of this. Of that, yeah. um, but also I would say Blossom and Root has a lot of this where, mm-hmm. you know, we, when we did uh, the science-based unit study, that was all, ba- we did pre- prehistory. And even when we did space science in mm-hmm. K, it was all very book based it was all based in stories and there was story yeah. there i mean obviously there was great books but there was also uh, literature that went along with things build your library does the same when it comes to sciences they're going to involve literature book shark as well as book shark is kind of is, an all-in-one curriculum yep that's yeah. another one that, that would be well known for this uh, we tend to kind of gravitate towards things that are literature based because we like to read so much yep. um, and we love we love books so uh, but that's a really common uh a common teaching style and to connect through those stories to the subjects. And, you know, reaching back to last week, we can pull out different curriculums that will have this element. You can create a whole curriculum yourself based around literature, or you can use something like build your library or, you know, other types of curriculums as well. We talked about eclectic um, last week where you're kind of picking, you know, picking and choosing, you know, mixing and matching, tailoring mm-hmm. to what, what works best for you. This is both a method of learning, but also a way of assembling your curriculum That's as well. Right. You can say, I'm going to just pick literature and you can make choices on what type of literature. It could be modern literature um, or it could be classic literature, things that maybe are even in the open source, older mm-hmm. books. Really making that choice. You'll see that with the classical education as well. They'll pick older books as kind of like core literature based things. So not only is it a method, but it's also a style and kind of an element that you may see as you're looking across various That's curriculum true. styles. So it's one of those ones that kind of like stretch between the two. Mm-hmm. Next one is one that we haven't really heard a lot about, but um, the, I'll, I'll try to pronounce it, Reggio Emilia approach. Right, this was originating in Italy. This is okay. all based on children learning through experiences and interactions with their environment. So it really emphasizes project-based learning and collaboration is a big key here. So. In this, a lot of arts as well. A lot of yeah. arts. There's not really a curriculum. It's more of a. Um, it focuses on collaborative learning and self and, and being self guided in that learning. So sure. whereas Montessori does lots does some self guided learning, but it's more independent. This is more collaborative gotcha. between kids and between kids and other members of. Uh, 
other members of society that they that they can form relationships with and learn in a collaborative setting. These are the different wrinkles that we see with these curriculums that have the learner led element kind of at the heart of where they are. Right. Um, you'll see different wrinkles on how they handle that learner led movement, whether you're an unschooler and you're just like, I'm walking with you. Like what you said with Montessori. They're more teachers. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and, and Montessori is kind of a setup type environment yeah. where they've kind of set this where is Reggio Emilia uh, seems to be much more discovery based yeah. um, and self-guided in that way. And kids yeah, are like, all like working together. Just different wrinkles on that same concept. Maybe just keep that in the back of your mind of uh, learner led, learner focused, learner guided type of education. There are many, many ways to to do that. There's different ways to put those Lego pieces together. And this is, I think, one of those as well. Another one that we have heard a lot of is unit study based, where you go out and you pick, you know, short bursts of learning. They can be two weeks, one, you know, one week, one day, some, some respects, four months, three weeks, yeah, six weeks, it however be it is. Whatever you want it to be. And you are tailoring a different experience. Now, these uh, unit studies can be thematically put together. And we'll talk a little bit about thematically base curriculum a little bit later, but in essence, you are finding out what your student wants to learn. You go out or, and get, yeah. you go out and get a, 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 a unit study, you know, teachers pay teachers, or maybe there are some independent creators out there as well. You can center your unit studies on um, certain topics, whether it's science, you can do it on literature, you can do it on almost anything. Right. You could say like, oh, I'm, we're going to do a three-week unit study all about volcanoes. Exactly. Right. We did a, we did a four-week unit study on Harry Potter and the mythology behind Harry Potter, yep. for example, yep. um, which I didn't buy i just we did the uh, holidays around the world with the build your library right that was a unit study that we did uh technically prehistory was a unit study yeah. from build your library so you can buy something you can make something the goal is that you're you're uh just kind of focusing on one thing and you can either focus on that like let's say volcanoes you can either say okay um i'm just gonna learn oh, we're gonna learn all about volcanoes and the science of volcanoes or you could say, well, we're going to take we're going to take volcanoes and we're going to spread that across multiple subjects. So we're going to learn about the science of volcanoes. We're going to learn about the history of great volcanic eruptions. We're going to learn about Pompeii, and we're going to read some literature that involves volcanoes. Exactly. And so we're going to touch different areas. We're going to study triangles and math uh, by studying volcanoes and right. maybe even lava flow and speed. Right. We'll and We'll do some experiments. We'll we'll do some volcano art. We'll make yeah. our own will volcano sculpture and then have it erupt right exactly. so you can decide how many different subjects you want to pull in or you can just say and hey we're just well you can make right. yeah. or we're just going to go all science and yeah. we're just going to dive into what it means to be a volcanologist and, and all about volcanoes so yep. I, what I like about unit studies is they can have whatever duration you want them to have, yep. and they can be on whatever subject. Even if nobody has written a unit subject, a unit study on that thing, yeah. like your kid is fascinated with dump trucks and they want to know <laughs> all about it. You can just say, all right, fine. I'm going to go to the library and I'm going to get these books and I'm going to come up with art and I'm going to do this. And we're going to do this entire unit study on dump trucks because that's what my kid We're going to set out the chairs on Monday morning uh, at six in the morning with our hot chocolate. And we're going to watch the dump truck come through and pick up the trash. <laughs> yes, that's funny. Our, our four-year-old went from the time she was like two, she called the, the trash doom truck, truck, the dump truck. The doom we're truck. like, it's not exactly a dump truck. It's a trash truck. Anyway, anyway, she never got it. But even now she goes, the doom truck's coming. The doom truck's coming. Even though she's she's four. Um, so yeah, so, so unit study studies are really neat and they can be whatever duration they can be on whatever topic and some families will decide to like do everything they do in unit studies mm -hmm. and others will you know do normal math and reading and then a unit study for for science and they'll they'll go through different unit studies or unit studies for history yeah. so it's not necessarily like like all of these approaches it's not necessarily an all or nothing yeah. game and you can also see people who may choose a big curriculum say like build your library and you want to do ancient civilizations but your learner is not really going to be hot up on you know the sumerians or the whatever they're just really interested in the greeks the romans and the egyptians and mm -hmm. you can imagine saying okay i'm going to do what build your library does for those weeks and then i'm going to put together or buy um you do it yourself or get something that extends that learning sure. deeper. And then I'm going to fill in the 30 week period. I'm just going to talk about these three ancient civilizations. Right. We had some We're going friends. to read famous books on those times. So we had some friends that did a whole Greek summer. Yeah. They were doing build your library level and they one. Just kept Greece for the whole summer. Yeah. But they decided their kids were like, we love Greece. We want to do everything Greece. And they were like, fine. 
yeah. the whole summer. That's what they did. And yep. they kind of turned it into a unit study. They did. And and not, it was funny because they, they were um, ahead of us because we were, I think, just starting ancient civilizations then and they were already up to Greece. So it was about 50% of the way through the curriculum. And then they spent the whole summer and even into the fall doing it. Yeah. And now we're all caught up at the same time. So yeah, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. Yeah. And one of the things about this is it really encourages students to find you know, interconnections through various, yeah. you, they can start to see like the real world applications of various subjects. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a child that's, that's failing to see why it's important to learn X, Y, Z topic, these can be a great way to connect those threads. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, at that core is again, learner dread led learner, learner focused education. It's just how you're implementing it mm -hmm. and how you're doing it. Um, I, I really like that. Next one would be project-based learning. Ariel, do you need a project planner <laughs> that knows how to use Trello and and Notion and <laughs> and and all these Jira and all these fancy tools? Is that what you need? Do you no. need Ariel's? Uh, no. Uh, no. So <laughs> email us at homeschool together podcast at gmail.com if you'd like Ariel to plan your school. Oh, <laughs> Ariel's like I, I can barely plan our school. I can plan our school. Um so this one's kind of similar to unit studies, but basically project-based learning is going to focus on getting your kids involved in a real life project. Oftentimes it's going to involve critical thinking and collaboration, solving creative problems. We have a, a friend who's- These are both big and small projects. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is uh, students who are going to take a really active role in planning the project, executing it. They're going to learn through the process. So a lot of this is independence. I mean, if your kids are younger, you can help them with it, but- we have a friend who has a son in a, a class that's all project based at our parent partnership. And he spent the whole year working on a, on a, was it a, uh, it was water? a water, water charging system for a cell phone? Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was, so he wait, wait, it was so he solar. Wanted, yeah. He wanted to catch oh, no. um, water off a downspout and then also have solar panels as well um, so that he could charge a phone in his room. <laughs> that was his whole project and so yeah. the, the easy one was the solar panel part because he could piece together the, the but he had to learn the electronics for it you guys were going feet. over the different the electrical system he had to learn he was learning about turbines yeah so he could figure out how to make the water generating work. electricity and voltage and all that stuff he got incredibly into this project he spent the whole year learning about it um he ended up studying about famous water turbines and yeah, yeah. and things and and so he did some learning there and he learned all about the electronics and all about the mechanical yeah. properties and the whole thing and had a blast with it. So yeah. um, this is similar to unit study, but you're coming up with a, a big project. This is going to be a, a really about the, the passion of your student for mm. that project. Yeah. I, I don't think that these are typically going to be like a parent assigned type of thing because they're going to be giving countless hours and lots of time into doing well, these projects. And it's got to be driven by the learner, I think at the core, because and otherwise you're setting a big project and you're essentially pushing the child through the project. And that will be pretty difficult to stay on track on that same task, on that same goal for so long. On, on a singular element without kind of losing the learner along the way. Mm -hmm. um, the learner really needs to be pulling themselves through that. It needs to be a passion behind it. And you, you may see a lot of unschoolers do this type of method where yeah. there's project-based learning. Um, you may see some eclectic parents as well. Like, okay, my, my kid really, 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 really likes planes. Like it's just, they love planes. And you know what? He's 14. I'm going to get him some flying lessons and he's going to build a little model plane in the, in the, in the garage and he's going to go fly it at the local, you know, I go on these nice long walks on a, on a trail here, um, in Western Washington. And I walk by this, like, you know, um, RC airplane, uh, airport and these yeah. guys will fly the planes and stuff. So you can imagine just all of these different layers mm -hmm. and elements that you could put in because my son just loves planes. And you're doing, you know, your right start math and you're doing all about reading, but also you're doing this big project. And so, again, eclectic learning could also be part of this where you're pe right. peeling in this type of massive project base because you have a student who is absolutely just dead set on this thing. And it's yeah. kind of something we talk about all the time where, you know, a lot of homeschool parents will test the waters on a thousand things. Sure. And because we want to see, we want to see try to help our child find the thing they're passionate about. Right. Yeah. Like we, we were talking, you were talking to some parents about, um, their, their young ones were just passionate about soccer, right? Mm -hmm. Like they were just from six years old all the way up until they're, they're now 26. And 
every day they're practicing for two or three hours, yeah. right? So imagine you could take that passion up for a sport and you go, oh, that's just a sport. But yeah, but what, what goes on with sports? You have diet, nutrition, mm -hmm. kinesiology, biology. Yeah. And one of those guys, training. his daughter went to school for Be. kinesiology, and now she's actually a professional soccer player. Exactly. And she has a degree in kinesiology. Yeah. So, you know, it's... Uh, there, there's so many things we can yeah. do and be so creative, even in those things that we think are not as cool. Like, oh, my kid loves playing Minecraft. Great. What can we do? Oh, with so the, much engineering to with, be done with, with Minecraft. With a passion. Can they build stuff in Minecraft? Can they... Maybe they're interested in the computers and running their own servers, and then they got to learn that technology. Yeah. Maybe it's not really just Minecraft. It's the it's the idea of building a world, and maybe they want to get into writing or like just test it. Because if you if you have a student who is who is just getting lost into some topic, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I love seeing kids who are just like everything that they do is that thing, because I mean. In some respects, it can be a challenge as an educator, as a parent, because they don't want to do anything else. But then there's also this awesome element where it's like, they're willing to do the thing that, you know, it takes me a lot of work to get my kid mm -hmm. to go do her violin practice and go do your Irish step dance. Go do, we need to do our math now. We like, I'm pushing, pushing, pushing. Very rarely does my daughter pull. And she pulls with audiobooks. She pulls with Lego. And so those are the things like, I'm kind of like, okay, how can yeah. I use these things? Not as a carrot and stick element where it's like, you can't have that unless you do this, but how can I use this to get this other thing as well? Or how, how, how deep will she go into other topics because it's tangentially related to that? And that's that discovery mode. And we see unschoolers have that as well. That's right. When they get into this, where they see somebody dive into something and you're just like, okay, and you're holding on to the reins because it's because <laughs> the horse is pulling now, right? It's right. This, and it's an exciting moment because you're like, oh man, what, what can I get for all this? What, what else can I do? You know? <laughs> How else can I incorporate it? Yeah. Well, and talking about pulling, the next one is accelerated learning. So yeah. these are folks who have kids that are gifted and they can't just use a traditional curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to look for ways to, and some curriculums are going to be more set up for this than others that will allow you to expand and make it more advanced and keep those, those, it's like what we, we talk about, like shoveling coal yeah, into the, the, into, yeah, the, in the into the train to keep it going. Um, and so, coal shoveling man. Yeah. So those kids are going to need a lot more yeah. um, input because they're moving at a different pace. It's funny. You think about like having a gifted learner is like, oh man, that wouldn't that be great. They would just get all this stuff. We've talked to several parents of gifted learners and it's a real challenge to keep them challenged keep and them fed. Keep, keep them engaged and all that. So um, accelerated learning programs, if you see that, that's going to be for kids who need that extra. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna need more in-depth, more challenge. Reading chapter books at four years old. We've, more we've, enrichment. We've talked to those parents and they said it is, it's intimidating because it's, it, it feels like they're, they're an they're an empty well. Like you can just pour as much. Well, into and they're you maybe want. not emotionally ready, but they can yeah. read it, and they they need the challenge. So it can be it or, can be difficult. Or it can be difficult. We we heard um, some kids who are just unbelievably gifted at reading. Um, all of a sudden, at ten years old, they read so well, you just take it for granted, and now they run into words that they don't know, and they don't know how to phonetically say those words. Right. Right. And then you have to go back and backfill grammar and, and, and everything. Yeah. And, and you have it, some like, kids that are really accelerated in certain subjects yeah. and not in others. It, so that's one that, you know, if this applies to you, you'll know it. But if you see something that says it's accelerated, then that's or, what they mean. Or by even that. you may have a mildly accelerated re, uh, learner. Like for example, our daughter, um, she's about two, two levels ahead now in, in math, right. fourth grade math. She's second grader, fourth grade math. Um, we're not moving super fast. Yeah. It's just, you know, we go all year round and we kind of finish the curriculum uh, a little bit sooner and then we just pick up the next one and it just it's now kind of cascading ahead and it's not that you're, so it doesn't have to really be like super advanced like genius right. level thing you could just have a learner that's accelerated and if you say you get one of these box curriculums and you're outstripping the math how do you do that how do you how do you move forward in that respect we had right. um, this thing called school to go at our school where they were giving parents a box curriculum that they were assembling themselves and they allowed you to move faster in certain curriculum. So does your curriculum allow you to move faster if you can in certain elements without having to abandon the entire curriculum? So these are things to think about, um, especially if you're an accelerated learner. We've had the fortunate, um, fortunate, uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to interview a number of people who 
are, are part of this other this next method, which we call world schooling. Right. So um, they they really are focusing on experiential learning yeah. all around. So but, they're but taking that to like a level that we wouldn't even really expect, right? Yeah. They usually will travel extensively and they immerse themselves in the cultures that they are visiting yeah, with. Go as far as learning the language mm-hmm. and, and like even putting them in like a small school that's in that area for a couple of days a week. You right. Know? And so a lot of times this will manifest not in the primary subjects. This might not manifest in math or teaching reading mm-hmm. necessarily, but um, there are families that they, they dive all in. They're going to do science. They're going to base it on the flora and fauna of that area mm-hmm. and maybe the uh, geologic features of that area. When they're talking about history, they're going to dive in and do all you know, all about the history of that area. We, when we went to Ireland earlier yep. in 2023, we really leaned into learning all about the history of that area. And we learned a lot about read the geology. We that. read books about it. We listened to music from it. We tried to immerse ourselves. So even if you don't travel all the time, you can pick up parts of world schooling, um, or you may sometimes hear road schooling as well. So those mm-hmm. are going to be folks who are we're traveling quite a bit for the whole year or part of the year or something. Mm-hmm. Lots of um, families who have uh, a parent who works remotely or has some sort of job that they, they can travel with, they really love the concept of traveling around and having all these experiences with their kids. Um, and you can even take that um, a little bit different as well with respect to, you know, what if you're a deployed family that is deployed to Germany or Absolutely. deployed to the Middle East or something of that nature? If, you're, if you're, your job has to... You know, we have a friend who had the opportunity possibly to go and spend two years in Norway and, right. and work there. I mean, the, it's not just this idea of traveling. Sometimes your life circumstances need to take up your family and put them in a new place. Mm-hmm. How can you take advantage of that as an experience, right. as something that's, you know, timeless for your children to, you know, remember and learn and experience those type of things? I think that's, there's a lot to be, to take with you. Even if you don't do a lot of traveling, mm-hmm. even if you don't get into an RV and spend all your life driving around, or if your husband, you know, if your your spouse, you know, isn't a coder and you can't live in Singapore, you know, <laughs> whatever it might be, like there are different ways to handle that and and incorporate that type of learning. So it's not just this, you know, extreme case. Like yeah, right, it yeah. could also be that you even travel around the United States and and you know you go to certain places and you study all about the history of that area and the peoples that were indigenous there and you know I mean there could be lots of things that you do. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're globe trotting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, speaking about a focus with traveling, going a little bit more into the curriculum, the single subject focus curriculum. Right. So this is going to be folks who decide that they are going to focus solely on one subject at a time Mm -hmm. to the exclusion usually of most of the other ones. And Mm -hmm. they're just going to dive all in. This works really well for, especially for some neurodivergent families where their, their learner is just like, they are all into something and that's what they want to do. So rather than having to feel like we're hopping Mm -hmm. from subject to subject to subject, and I could see how this would actually when our daughters get older and they don't need that daily reading practice i could as far as reading instruction right they still be reading every day but um i could see how this could be kind of a great a great style to adopt at some point where we say like hey for this month we're not doing science we're not doing anything else we are going to dive in and study this time in history or for the next month we're going to dive in and we're going to learn all about weather or whatever it you could it's kind of unit study-ish, except that this is where they're they're either entirely or mostly cutting out everything else and focusing on this. And I've actually seen this at the collegiate level. I don't know if I've seen, if I've heard about it at the high school or, or, or public school level. Um, but there was a, I think Appalachian State did this. I don't know if they're still doing this. I remember when I was applying for college, you know, just a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, and Sorry. they had a, <laughs> very sad, um, they had a thing where they were doing sequential classes. So you would take a class for eight or nine weeks. You would do it five days a week, two hours a day. You would run through this entire class, have your final at the end of that period, and then you go and start a new class. So you could be calculus. It could be biology. It could be chemistry. It could be history. Whatever it is, you were taking them sequentially. So you put all your focus on that one thing. And in that... In that thing, you're excluding other things like math and science. You're just doing history. You're right. just doing whatever class you're I doing. I think that's pretty cool, actually. It's kind of a cool, novel way of, of approaching that. And I've seen that in practice, so it's not that foreign of a concept. Um, you know, even at 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 you know 
university level. Yeah, my and, MBA is the same way. And we'll where talk it's about only one yeah. class at a time, and yeah. you only do that for like seven weeks, and then you move on to another class, and, exactly. you, and you don't double them up. Yeah, and the, we're going to talk about another method at the end that I actually experienced as well at my first college that I went to. Um, but this is kind of a cool method where you're just kind of like, okay, we're going to just dive and focus. And I like that where you, yeah. you can almost imagine like your project based learning or something of that nature where you're, you're saying, okay, we're just going to do this one thing. So you can see some um, um, similarities between these methods and, and yeah. where maybe this method could be a way of doing your curriculum, but also something to plug into another curriculum or another method. And this could be cool if you're doing an online program, let's say that has no set pace. Yeah. You could say focus on one thing at a time. Oh, yeah. I know that there's a there's a college here, uh, Western Governors University, yeah. and you can you pay by the semester. You could take as many things as you want. Yeah. So you could just focus on one thing at a time. I could see like if you were doing, let's say, one of those Khan Academy classes, and we mm -hmm. wanted that high school credit at our parent partnership. Mm -hmm. You could say like, okay, for you know, three weeks. You're just going to do this to the exclusion yeah. of everything else. Or let's say that your child is maybe getting ready for an AP exam or something. <laughs> yeah. This might be the way to really tackle that. So, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to be going and taking this test. So you're going to focus here and, could, and to, to the exclusion of everything else. That's absolutely, that's a great way to put that. And also you could maybe even use it as a summer type of thing where sure. um, if your learner is loves math, they're addicted to math, they love it. Um, okay, great. We're off in the summer, but... Listen, if you want to do Khan Academy classes and you can go as fast as you want, sure. just go ahead and just do all of, you know, Algebra 1 or and Algebra 2. maybe they want to dive into a language oh, and they want to great, just, just dive into a language. They don't want to be thinking in multiple languages or have they want to just like really all day, every day. make some real gains in something that needs lots of practice and lots of touch, right? That's a great one. Um, so that would be really awesome for a single study focus. Or if you have kind of a learner who is um, very devoted to a skill, Based mm -hmm. type of thing where you know we have our friends who love to ski maybe you want to be a competitive skier and go ski at montana right. state University or you want or to you want to play golf and golf. you want to play golf at the collegiate level or something so you're going to take a whole month and you're going to do yeah. nothing but spend all day every day out on the course mm -hmm. during that summer month and, and so you can be ready and there's so many things that you can bring into that that is educational based there's oh, yeah. also a lot of social emotional learning if this is a um, individual skill that is you know whether it's a sport or say like Oh, my learner loves clay. Um, they want to be a potter. They've, they've always wanted to do it. And mm -hmm. they're going to spend eight hours a day doing pot pottery in the summer. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're going to learn about temperatures and they've got to learn about firing their stuff. They've got to mm -hmm. learn about different type of clay materials, different shapes, yeah. different thicknesses, all the tools that they need to learn, how to run those, how to maintain those. Like this is a chance. And I think the beauty of homeschooling is that we are allowed the opportunity that if, if we are lucky enough that one of our students and one of our children finds that thing they love and yeah. they are allowed to put the 10,000 hours in that nobody else right. will allow. It, no, you could not do in public school or in private school or even other some type of education. We have the ability to give them that opportunity to be the to do the thing that they want to do and be the best at it well, or give them the time to be the be the best they can. Yes, and this is a great opportunity too if you want to try out what they might be interested in as a career. So to get an internship and be oh, able to spend all day and not be worrying about doing other subjects at the same time. Say, so, you know what, we're pausing everything else and you're going to focus on veterinary science because you want to be a vet and you've got an internship at a vet's office mm -hmm. and you're going to go there and you're going to you're going to spend this month and that's what you're going to do. Or you so, want to you want to be a game designer. Great, you're going to spend the whole summer building games in Python and you're going to put them out on your you know Steam thing for people to download yeah. and. You, you get that whole experience unencumbered, free to do what you want, yeah. especially if it's a creative thing. This is a great example of being able to do that. Yeah, and I think this will be a fun thing to get into as our students get older, especially if you can finish those milestones early. Mm -hmm. you know, if you can be running ahead in math or reading or whatever the subject is and get some things out of the way, then you can have the freedom to have the time. That's a great say, one. I've already, done, I've already met my high school requirements or whatever. I'm going to go ahead and take time to really – be passionate and get great at something. Well, we've and, talked about yeah. some parents um, at our parent partnership whose daughter is, that's dance for her, right? Four yeah. or five hours a day. She dances. Goes yeah. on the weekend. They drive They drive like three hours to go do lessons. It's like wild, right? Or if you're a soccer and you're on the travel team and you got to go play soccer or yeah. you know, you're know, you on the travel hockey team, whatever it might be, it's that you passion. have that passion, you can do it. Next one would be community-based learning. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about it before, but you know, leveraging your local resources 
really being passionate, especially if you live in a really cool area, you can see how this could, could even blend with the world schooling. Like, oh, I'm stationed in Paris for the next two years with my family. We're going to learn everything we can ever learn about. Right. It, this right? is one, or, especially for people that live in a, in a city and have lots yes. of opportunities for experiential learning. You live in New York City. And there's a lot and, of history built into the yeah, city. There's yeah, there's tons of museums and there's tons of this. You yeah. can just really lean into this. To some extent, uh, lots of us homeschoolers will lean into community-based learning, right? We're going on field trips and yeah. we're going to museums and we're, you know, we're doing different things, um, taking tours and whatever. So this is something that's going to come in a lot, but there are some folks who lean into this very heavily. And if you see a program or something that says that it's going to be community-based, that that's a real tenant of it, then you can expect there to be lots of interaction with members of the community, mm -hmm. lots of field trips and things, and lots of hands-on opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that element of, of using what's in your community because a lot of times those those activities and those places to go you know if you live in the northern virginia area you're going to have battlefields everywhere that you can go oh my to gosh, yeah. i mean out here so much history there out here we have a lot of uh tribal influences and mm -hmm. so you know every river city town road is named after some tribal thing and it's really cool because you can go learn about that yeah right? we have some awesome cultural centers to yeah, visit absolutely. and yeah so we've got some really really great resources yeah so whatever's so. whatever's in your community really latch on to if you're in a farming community there's a lot of history there right mm -hmm. go learn about all the cool stuff so really just like diving into what's local especially if your family is doing something or is part of the community in that way like for example maybe you are a farming family you're you're, you, you guys have the back 100 acres that you cultivate and whatever, right? Diving into the farming community, we have some friends who are, uh, uh, you know, they like hunting and stuff like that. That's a big thing in their home, in, mm -hmm. in their community. We have a lot of, you know, stuff here in the in, in the Western Washington where you can go do that, right? Like, there's just all these aspects that are, that are local, and local, yeah. local, and, and really lean on those because those are really important, I think. Absolutely. So oh. the next one is cooperative homeschooling, which if you've heard of a co-op, if, you, if you're new to homeschooling and you, that like, what does this mean exactly? It means that it, it's just like, uh, well, anything where it's a cooperative, it's everybody working together. Yeah. So if you're in a cooperative, whether it's a preschool or a different type of co-op meetup, this is where parents are going to come in and be teaching subjects. So maybe mm. you might teach science and I might teach art and I would never teach art because that would be sad, <laughs> but uh, maybe I might teach history um, or whatever. So this is where everybody, you're getting um, a group of parents that are coming mm. together and we're all helping to educate each other's children. Yeah. And sometimes these cooperatives are structured in the sense that they are entities that you pay to be part of um, we're lucky to be kind of in like a parent partnership with the school it's kind of like a partnership cooperative there it can be as disorganized as like the three families that live on the end of the street and we all work together Yeah, we have our little co-op she, she teaches math and i'll teach a little bit of reading and and we'll do some activities and i'll lead a, a walk later tomorrow so it could be very structured and, right, where you, you pay for it and everything. You pay for it or, or you even get public dollars in some respect <laughs> to get it, right? And you can go all the way down to just the family on the corner in the cul-de-sac and you got a couple of families that you homeschool yeah, together. Made your own it can be as wild as, as any of those. Um, so definitely think about that. It, it's a great way to answer that really t sticky question that we always have with respect to homeschooling is the socialization. Right. And the yeah. co-ops can help you with that a lot of times. Sometimes we have in our community, natural community, whatever that might be. Co-ops can help you solve that problem um, to get your kid with other kids, find other friends. Um, it can be as simple as a hiking group. It can be as complex as a parent partnership. So Right, yeah. In our area, we don't have a ton of co-ops because mm. we have a lot of public parent partnerships, although we do have several. They're just not close enough to us to, yeah. to go to them. But if we did not have public parent partnerships, there would be tons of co-ops in our area. So um, look for co-ops because that's a great opportunity for lots of peer interaction and things for our kids. Another method that maybe we've talked about kind of in, in its element, you have seen it with other curriculums, um, but is a thematic way of educating. So you take right. some overarching concept whether it's something that your child is interested in, you're doing learner-led learning with maybe unschooling type of model there, or it's something like Build Your Library, which is does ancient civilizations. Right, that's the theme of the, the year. Theme of the year. Or, is, or, the, is the whole thing, yeah. Or if you're doing some unit study type of thing, you're obviously m marching to a theme. So you'll see themes in your curriculum sometimes, but if you're an eclectic homeschooler and you want to put together your own thing and you're really, really good and you're, <laughs> yeah. you're dedicated 50 hours a week to building yeah. curriculum for yourself you will maybe like to put a theme so that everything feeds in right. to a general concept. It can help move along the learning. It can uh, um, um, 
key in on historical events. It can key in on local events. You can really see how you can fine tune this and see how yeah. it can it can be as easy as buying your build your library curriculum off their website and just following that or doing something super complex. Yeah, like you're doing a lot of thematic learning yourself right now, studying, you've been studying several of the, you've been studying the world wars and the civil war and, and I've been you've doing been- a, I've been doing kind of like, yeah, I've been doing kind of a, a dive personally on kind of old presidents. Right. Um, you know, late uh, 1800s, oh, I'm gonna do Washington this year, so you know, all the way down at the beginning, but late 1700s and then just trying to come up through the 1800s mm-hmm. and then as you learn about the people, obviously there are big moments that, that occur, civil war, things of that nature, uh, reconstruction, things of that nature. Um, then obviously big wars that can that can occur as well. And then who are the big players on that time frame? Read the biography of FDR, read a biography of Stalin. Right. Yeah. You can you can start piecing things together and these are kind of this learner led right. driven thing. And you're studying some of the science from the time too as yeah. science evolves. So you've got this well, big because personal Ariel, theme. I want to start my own little physics research lab in the garage and find zero point energy. I can make my UFOs and 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 take us to the stars. You're so weird. So we can, all right, we, can, all right. we can take the space science so to the next So that's thematic learning. So let's take it home with the last one, which is experiential learning, yes. which this is all focusing on hands-on experience. This is experiments. This is real world applications yep. where we deepen our understanding and, and help our kids to retain these different concepts. So this is encouraging lots of active engagement, lots of problem solving, mm-hmm. field trips, uh, or simulations through things. So this is all your kinesthetic hands-on learners. This is trying to, whatever curriculum you want to use or whatever trips you want to take this is all about the experiences and to kind of key in on that single subject learning method that we talked about like i think appalachian state was using i went to a small liberal arts college in pennsylvania for a year uh, dickinson college and their physics program was built on this method which was experiential learning um, at least for the undergrad classes the small classes the the beginning uh, we weren't lectured the physics concepts. They might've talked a little bit about it, but we went and did an experiment. And from the experiment, we then essentially learned the physics concept. We derived the equations from the data we would collect and plot it and figure out the, you know, what the, you know, what's happening and then go and backfill with theory. And so they did an experiential based learning to science where mm-hmm. we did exper- experiments first, learning second. Right. Essentially, I mean, obviously the experiments are learning, but in, in reality is like do the experiment and then find out what you were doing and then and, and what physics, you know, um, it was, I think we we're doing electricity and magnetism and uh, for that, for that, that semester I was in there and that was how they, they structured their curriculum. And so it's not just homeschoolers it's not some weird idea, like even universities can use this as well. Yeah. Oh. So these are these are the the styles, the different flavors of homeschooling. And like we said, this is just a these two episodes are just kind of an overview so that if you hear these terms floating around in different homeschool spaces or with different curriculum that you kind of get a general sense of what this is. So we will try to get into some deep dives on some of these topics um, in the the episodes to come through the year and things. We're going to do some more research because there's a lot of good stuff here, but we hope this was helpful for you know, seasoned homeschoolers and new homeschoolers alike. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!